Good afternoon, everyone. Depending on where you're tuning in from, we're back with another uh, edition of this YouTube Live program, uh, Marketing Experiments. Pull up a landing page if you haven't already and ask yourself a question. If I were to redesign this page from scratch right now, nothing to optimize, but actually rebuild it, what would I do step by step in order to produce the highest conversion rate? If you're joining us for the first time uh, and you haven't seen or uh, viewed any of the subsequent programs, we're drilling down in the middle of a 21-step approach to the psychological elements that you've got to include in every single web design. There's a lot of talk about conversion optimization, but if you design the page right in the beginning, there's very little optimization to do. And we have a lab that spent $138 million studying optimization, and particularly conversion, and more particularly, uh, the Greek word metanoia summarizes sort of the work that we've done, and it's really focused on that transformation from something into something else, from a prospect into a customer, for instance. At the heart of this is something happening in the mind. And we're going to break that down, but right away I want to take your attention to two pages. You see an A and you see a B. I'm not going to ask you to vote as we typically do, but if you were redesigning A and trying to get from A to B, what process would be unfolding in your mind in order to help you understand how to unfold that message in the mind of a visitor? When you get it right, it changes things. And in this case, this is an e-commerce example, and we saw a 36% increase in conversion. Let's look at a Let's look at a subscription example. One of the biggest brands in the country, version A, was pushed into version B. But version B was not uh, a collection of ideas. Version B was not the result of a compromise in a conversation between uh, competing thoughts. Version B was not uh, the result of somebody who is strong and perhaps high paid, who drove a big example. And yet, there's a difference. Now, while I'm talking to you about that, let me switch my words around from version B to version A because version B is the control and version A is the page we actually created. What did we see in results? 137% increase. Take a, good, take a look again at one more. This is a lead gen. If you're on this uh, program with us, you very likely are either doing lead gen e-commerce, or subscription. This is an, a lead gen play, and you can see two versions. Now just tell me which one of these do you think produces the highest response? Go ahead and vote. By, by the way, you're doing that, Dave, it's good to see you back. That's Dave Fogel. And Joshua Singer, I recognize your name. And Sean, I recognize you. And Moose Little Thunder, that's a hard name to forget. And Will, and Steven, all of you, it's great to have you back on the program. Tell me which version. I see some B's. Yes, B's. Good. And keep voting and I'll show you the results. Version B represents not a try, not some ideas, not the uh, end product of a robust discussion, but a piece of science, more particularly a piece of psychology that we then put into a scientific testing program in order to determine its overall impact on the sequence of thought. You want to see the results? Here it is, 331%. Now, many of you who've been with us over the years are used to seeing these types of results. You may have seen some of these case studies. We have the largest library of these case studies in the world. We're drawing from them at the beginning of this program in order to help everyone here zero in on how to get the most value out of the few minutes that we have remaining. We have been teaching for the last two weeks on the 21 psychological elements that impact and that help you create an, an effective design. With that in mind, I'm gonna go back to the graphic that we've been teaching from and make a few points and then begin to teach again. Now, there are two programs prior to this. I'm going to begin teaching at step nine, but you need to watch the last two YouTube Live programs. This will be over the last two weeks and you'll see the first few steps taught in depth and will help you understand why we're approaching steps nine all the way through 21 in the way that we are. That's the only introduction I can give, but I do have something that'll help you. Paul, pull up the page that shows you where you can download the graphic. This is a 
infographic. It's large. You can place it as a poster on the wall. You can get it in two sizes. There's no cost for it. So I'm only giving it to you to help the teaching be more effective. I want you to have something you can look at when this is over. You'll see uh, an image uh, uh, of the graphic on that right-hand side. Download it here. Pick whichever size you want, and you can use it in your own marketing efforts to sort of guide you after the end of the teaching. Back to the graphic. Let's begin with the critical point that we are on next, which is step nine, the what. So we've already determined who we're really trying to reach with our message. In doing so, we've acknowledged that marketing only has four primary components. It has the sender of the message, the receiver of the message, the message itself, and the means with which we communicate that message. Today I'm communicating via means of my voice and visually through YouTube Live. In all of your marketing, you're going to have to see there is a symbiotic relationship between the message and the means. And you must always begin, not with the sender, which is our instinct and which promotes our blind spot, but with the receiver. Who are we trying to reach? Now we talked about that in depth. We talked about flow, the personality of your site, that people don't buy from websites, people buy from people. We talked about how to build connection, the establishing of rapport, the critical way a headline introduces and begins, initiates true relationship. We talked about the three questions you have to answer in the first four inches of your page. You have seven seconds to answer those. And now we move to the what. One of the most interesting mistakes I see on the internet can be explained by looking at some of the live op examples we have, but so often we make one of two grave mistakes in the design of our page. The first mistake is we talk about the why before we talk about the what. Now, this is actually an example of a mistake that's made on larger scale and often in our designs. If we don't flow the page like we would a conversation with a sequence of thoughts, then we often get the wrong point in the conversation too soon. Now, if I just met you, let's suppose we were at a restaurant just now and we're talking, and let's suppose I just met you and we've been talking five minutes and I invite you on uh, vacation with my family, or I invite you to purchase an expensive research project. Well, we all can see that that's a huge mistake. If you're at a conference or an event, you don't walk up to a stranger at the event and push your business card in their hand and ask them to spend $100,000 with you. When we exaggerate this mistake, it becomes clearer. But the problem is, we make this mistake at micro steps all along the way. One of the worst things that we do is we start talking about why they should purchase before they're very clear on what it is that you truly offer, the true nature of the solution. It's vital that you don't drive the why before you drive the what. So this is critical mistake number one. I see it all the time. I'm warning you that right now you should be thinking about this in conjunction with one of your pages. In fact, You'll get more out of this if you're switching back and forth between me and looking at your own web page. I want to ask you a question. What's the second mistake? The second biggest mistake that we see when people are trying to get the why and the what right on their page. Think about it for just a moment. Give me some, some thoughts. Yaakov, I see your desire for an example. I have one queued up and it's coming in just a few moments. But first, let's talk about a second mistake. We tell the what, but we don't really give an adequate why. So the what comes, but the why is insufficient. And I'm going to simply abbreviate that. The why is insufficient because we get so busy loading our weapon and firing at people that we don't stop and reflect on the necessary sequence of thoughts that lead to an inevitable conclusion. So now look at your page and ask yourself a question. Is it all why with not enough what? Are you telling me why I should buy? You're telling me how good you are, how amazing you are, how fast you are. You're the leading this. You're the first that. You're the best this. And I'm still not even clear what I can do here. If that's the case, 
I, you're, you're headed for trouble. I'll give you an example of that at a more sophisticated level. Many, many times we create a download for lead gen purposes and we confuse the what and why associated with a download. We confuse that with the what and why associated with our main offer. Clearly the download in many cases is not the main offer. It may be a white paper, it may be a book, it may be many things. It may be what I just described, a master graphic. But if it is, you've got to think for a moment and say, wait a second, what is the objective of this page? This is back to the principles we taught earlier. And if the objective is to get people to do a download, do not spend 50% of your time on your product and 50% of the time talking about the download. If your mix is not something we taught earlier when we taught objective, it if, is, if it isn't 70% focused on one objective, if that page divides attention and doesn't provide a 70% focal point minimum on the key objective, you're going to hurt your conversion rate. So decide right away, do I talk about the product a lot or do I talk about the download? Now you might be saying, but, but when do I know which one I should do? Well, I'll give you a clue. When the download is closely related to the product, you can talk about the product in such a way like a free trial. But when the download is different than the actual product itself, be very careful because you try to sell two things at once and you fell at both. I've taught years ago when we teach in our clinics on conversion, never choose an incentive that you have to sell so that you can sell what you're really selling. Unpack that slowly and think about it. But if I have to sell and explain the incentive, and I, if it takes that much salesmanship and that much energy, it's taking away the core of my message. Now that's not the download, that's an incentive, but it's the same principle. Sometimes they're the same, most of the time they're not. All right, so I've said there are two big problems when you talk about the what and you talk about the why. I wanna give you just a third for you to keep in mind because I see this one all the time. It is failure to communicate the what and the why in a conversational tone. Now let me explain to you why that's important. The best way for me to illustrate it is to embarrass myself. And I'm gonna to try to do that right now by changing the way I speak to you. Listen to the shift in my communication. Listen closely and you'll start to see it. There are 21 keys, 21 psychological elements that drive success. The why is important. It's critical that you understand the what. Of the 21, 11 is vital. The first four are critical. We have the best arrangement of the thought sequence and 21 elements you can find anywhere in the world. Now, if you'll notice what's happening, I'm speaking to you in bullet points using declaration, and it's disgusting. Not only is that braggadocious, but it's disgusting and hard to follow because it's just like bullets being fired across the bow of the marketer's ship. It is all declaration, and it is not enough explanation. And yet, when you talk to a marketer who designs a page like this, and his page tends to be, or her page, all titles, uh, and, and all, you know, sometimes not even complete thoughts and boxes and banners and basically we throw things at you. That is so wrong. What you have to do, first of all, is establish rapport. That's the connector phase in your, in your 21 elements diagram. Once you've connected and established rapport, you need to explain. And that explanation takes place not just with your mouth, and this is going to get a bit confusing because we're talking about a web page. But explanation requires something more than your mouth. In fact, I would say it is uh, only about 20% your mouth and about 80% your ears. Now, wait a second. Wait a second. 20% your mouth, 80% your. How can the ears work when you're designing a page? The most important. The most important sense you have, the most important element of your own physiology you can bring to the design of a web page is actually your ears and potentially your eyes. But you're using your eyes in order to tune your ears because this is a message 
and even if it's visual, it is stimulating a conversation in the mind. And if I can't hear how this sounds to you, if I can't hear when I'm creating anxiety, if I can't hear when I'm creating friction, if I can't hear when I'm inadequately communicating value, then I can't get the saying right. I can't get the telling right. The hearing is preeminent over the saying. Get the hearing right and you can say. Now, there's more I want to talk about this, but we're talking about the what and the why. Let's look at one of our pages and I'll just show you as an example how we've thought about that. So pull up, Paul, the, uh, the quick win. I'm not proud of this page. It's just being tested. It's just another page and there'll be many more and there'll be better pages. Uh, you've seen this and I want to scroll down so people can get a first an overall look of it. All right. And then, then we're going to go back up to the top. Let's think about the page and zones. So boost your conversion rate with a Mech Labs quick win intensive. There's a get on the front. We taught headlines. There's a whole YouTube live on how to build headlines. You can get that from us by going through this series. You'll find that and it'll help you. We can also put a link here in the chat so that you can get that. And then it, it, it emphasizes that again beneath it, get Mech Lab scientists to help you find the fastest way to drive a major revenue increase. Now look at what one, two, and three do. They're not a bunch of rabid claims. Uh, there is and should be no hyperbole. What you're looking at is an explanation of the three key elements that compose what this is. Here comes the what. The data scientists at Mech Labs will help you visualize your funnel while searching for key behavioral patterns uh, that yield conversion opportunities. Two, and I'm looking to the left because that's where my monitor is, by the way. Then they will study the customer psychology of your offer. You will get two types of actionable insights. Fix nows and test nows. Three, and they will score and critique the force of your value proposition. So this is the beginning explanation of what it is. Now, do I have to explain it completely? No, but I have to explain it enough. If I don't reach the critical enough phase, then you can't move them forward. Now, after the what, let's drill down to the why. And as we're doing so, just scroll that page down from uh, in the control room. You'll see that we're explaining it in more detail with video, sort of our thinking and our approach. But look at this next piece. This is about Mech Labs. It's all factual. It's not claims. It's facts designed to produce a conclusion about its value proposition. Built the first and oldest conversion marketing research program in the world. Pioneered the conversion industry, et cetera, et cetera. Invested two decades and $138 million. I'm not going to read all of these and I'm not promoting Mech Labs right now, but can you see how that set of bullets are the why? This is why Mech Labs can help you. But the why follows the what. Now, if you look over on the right-hand side, you'll see supporting information, which is what you should have in the right-hand column. Nothing that is essential to the sale. It is only supporting information. Look at the top of uh, supporting information. You have videos, but you have five critical pieces designed to address anxiety and friction. It's designed for lead gen, e-commerce, or subscription paths. So it works for all of those types of businesses. So if you're wondering, well, does it work for my business? I'm in the subscription business. No long-term contracts. All the things you might be concerned about were touched there in supporting information. Not essential, but vital. Now, scroll up. Even when you look at the form, look. It tells you what to expect if you respond. The model, the cost, the resource requirements, key deliverables, timeline. These are the questions people want answered. So now we're giving you a what associated with what's going to happen if you respond with this form. Do you see the simplicity of this approach? It's conversational and it's ordered in a thought sequence. If that's making sense for you, I want to keep teaching because we have a lot to cover. But ultimately, remember those errors. Getting the, getting the what above the why is important. If the why comes first, you may lose them. I don't care about a lot of things until I know what it is. The second big error is not, not really spending enough time on the why to help me understand your unique value proposition, why I should choose you rather than anyone else. Those are two of the primary problems, and we'll stop there, and let's move now to point 10 in more depth. 
Now, point 10 closely connects to the first YouTube live program in this series on the value proposition. And Paul, if you could uh, send that link in the chat, that will be helpful. Remember, by the way, if today is helpful, subscribe, please, share, uh, or like this and, and share this with a friend. It, it helps us as we try to build a community. And the bigger this community gets, the more we can learn from each other. We, we don't have all the answers. We're still trying to understand. In fact, I'm embarrassed after 30 years of researching a single question. Why do people say yes? I'm embarrassed at what I don't know yet. But I, I do know that by interacting with people like you, we can learn. And we can use that in order to grow our own knowledge and discover what really, what truly matters. Now, as you think about that, let's talk about the why. So, most of you are familiar with the why. Let me ask those of you on YouTube Live who've had some of our training or been in these programs right now, can anybody articulate the primary question of the value prop? If I, I'll start you with those two words, go ahead and type it in. If I, I'm going to watch for a moment to see what you put in. Betsy, by the way, it's good to see you again. I saw an email from you this week and uh, I'm glad to have you on the program. But if I, that question is the most critical question. That's right. Dave says, David Carrier says, am your ideal customer. So that's the first piece. And I'm not teaching value prop today because that's in a separate program. But I want you to understand the question that you've got to answer with the why. And that is this. If I'm the ideal customer, why should I purchase from you? Or why should I choose you rather than, and you guys fill in the blank, X, Y, and Z. You might name your three top competitors. It may not be an overt competitor. It could be someone else that gets that dollar. It might be not doing anything, which is another way to lose that dollar. But until you know the options, and until you can answer that, don't design a page. I am appalled by how many web projects I've seen where they talk to me about their web project, and then I ask them if they can explain their value proposition, and they don't have it. They don't understand it. They don't know how to communicate it. Now, if you can't communicate your value proposition, don't redesign your website. Listen, shuffling the bricks around your house won't necessarily make it a better house. You better have a purpose and a mission so that when you approach that, you're aligning every element to serve that purpose, which is to communicate your value proposition in such a way as to enable people to give you that valuable yes. The rebranding and redesign projects have kept agencies in business all over the world. And while I have great empathy for agencies and a third of my students are from agencies, I have to warn you that if you can't get this piece right, if you don't have these psychological elements laid out, if you're not clear on that very first number on this list of 21, and if you can't answer this critical number 10, you're not ready to design anything. You have to know one Let's, let's look at the, let's scroll down. I have them listed here. You have to have, know one, the profile to the objective, and you've got to know uh, 10, the why, before you touch anything else. If you don't understand those, you can't get the design right. And so many of us should slow down, and our first, our first move shouldn't be to tell an agency to build our site. It should be to develop within our team a time to reflect on the answers to these questions and get as close as we can to the correct answer. So the why has got to be the critical piece that your page now addresses. And it does it, first of all, be being able to articulate it in a single ultimate reason. Now, I want to explain that. So take a look at what I draw here. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw a line that represents something I'm going to put above it. Oh, you are, and I mean ultimate reason. Now, the ultimate reason is a capstone. It's the capstone for an evolutionary argument. So now I'm going to put an EA here, an evolutionary argument. And the evolutionary argument is a series of critical pieces that produce four conclusions in the mind. And it composes the argument for your existence in the marketplace. And if you can't get the argument right, you don't deserve to exist in the marketplace. And in fact, time will terminate you. Some of us are, are surviving on pockets of ignorance, but you will not survive forever because eventually market dynamics will catch up with you in the same way we've seen species that go extinct. You, your business, and your dreams will go extinct. 
To get this right, you've got to be able to sit down and thoughtfully produce an argument that is the, the true answer to the question, again, if I am the ideal customer, why should I purchase from you rather than any of your competitors? Now, if you get that argument right, here's what you're going to find. It's going to be maybe half a page or a long paragraph. And, and you're going to want to try to state it. This is very important. And these are things that go beyond what I've taught in, say, the value prop piece as I take you a little further in the context of the 21 elements. When you finally stay it, you're going to find that you use modifiers, adjectives, adverbs, and prepositional phrases, some of which are quantifiable, some of which are qualitative. A quantitative answer is something that produces enormous credibility, and when you give this answer, it's not sufficient if it's not instantly credible. If it isn't something easy to believe, which is why your story is so important, because your story makes your claim believable. Never underestimate the power of story to communicate your brand and your value proposition. And at another point, in fact, you might want to use this feature to say if you'd like me to teach on this, I'd like to teach on the difference between brand and the value proposition. How to understand the two and how to put the two together. But for now, here's what I'm going to suggest, and if that's interesting to you, use the chat feature to tell us so. In the meantime, what I want to stress for you is that you first build the argument. It is not sales copy. It is the true argument. It's like an academic paper. It's the positive kind of argument. It's how science is advanced. Now, if you think about that in terms of uh, the evolution within the marketplace, you may come to a phrase often used in response to Darwin's original theory, and I don't necessarily subscribe to much of what I see in the biological approach and uh, to evolution and even in dating and other things that I personally have issues with. But let's go there for a second because there's a phrase we've heard called survival of the fittest. It's a phrase used in biology, science, but it's the same phrase that you need to apply to your business. Survival of the fittest is a warning that if you can't provide an answer here that is strong enough, you won't survive. But when you finally get it, it's, it's going to be a little bit confusing because you have, a, you have an answer and you're going to have to learn to convert it to marketing copy. And I'm going to tell you right now how to separate the quantifiable or the qualitative from the quantitative. But first, you've also got to learn to take this big answer and summarize it in a single compelling statement that produces four vital conclusions. And those four conclusions I'm not going to teach today. Go catch the YouTube live presentation on value prop and you'll learn the four conclusions that you're powering in the mind. What I want you to understand now is that you have a key statement, a summary, an ultimate reason that summarizes a critical argument, an evolutionary argument. But in the evolutionary argument, let's suppose these lines represent words. I'm going to create circles on the lines. These circles represent modifiers. I'll take, I'll take one. Let's suppose this circle tells me that you're the biggest. Now, unfortunately, there will likely be in any industry three biggest companies, three biggest organizations. And what I mean by that is two are lying. And one is not, and you can't tell the difference. And I can give you an example of that. Have you ever watched the advertising between AT&T and Sprint and the competing cell phone companies? We worked with Verizon, and we saw that through an independent study called a root metric study, they had the widest and best coverage across the U.S. And this was not something to be trifled with. The people who did this study put vans uh, and took thousands of trips down every road across America and had cell phones and studied the actual coverage and produced a, a truly rigorous scientific study and they were not paid or compensated by any of the cell phone companies, including Verizon. Verizon had the, had the greatest coverage. But as soon as Verizon came out with that, the other companies did their best to confuse you and keep you from understanding that. And uh, frankly, they went so far as to push the envelope all, you know, as far as they could go without getting in trouble with authorities. The truth is, it's an example of what we see everywhere. So you can't just say biggest. Do you know why? Because we won't believe you. And believing you is connected to one of these four conclusions. So every time you state something that you cannot back up 
with a quantitative verifiable fact or, and, and so meaning a modifier like biggest or fastest or many of the modifiers we use, you need to provide, here comes the next section, we're all talking about why, evidentials. Evidentials are two types of information that support your argument and thus your ultimate reason. The evidentials are either verifiable, quantifiable facts, or they are the opinion of somebody who is not working for you. They are the opinion of other trusted sources because everything can't be quantified in facts. It's hard to quantify customer service, it can be done, but when you have a four-star customer rating, that's some kind of quantification, and thousands of positive testimonials, it can make a difference. I'm doing a research project on that, I think, very soon we're about to start. Now, I share that with you to, to take you back to the diagram, and let's talk about how those evidentials come in to support the argument, which supports the reason, which follows the what. Go back to the uh, diagram and you'll see. One of the first things on that list, we could breeze right past and miss something critical. I am going to attack the common position, testimonials. Testimonials told right are still incredibly compelling and drive a almost inexplicable human response. But testimonials, the way we're using them on our websites, are fairly useless and a waste of space. Why? Because when uh, uh, J.R., from San Francisco says XYZ. We don't even know if there really is a JR. We don't know who that is. It's not verifiable. And we tend anymore to be more and greater and greater levels of skepticism about such claims. I think we are now doing what lots of people do. We're just copying somebody else. We put the testimonials on our site, but they don't work. Now, a testimonial can work, A, when it's compelling with story when it's matched with imagery, or B, when it's from a high authority person. Listen, Warren Buffett's testimonial had a lot to do with saving our economy in the 2008 meltdown. Warren made strong statements about key organizations and about the recovery of the economy, and it had a huge impact on depositors and people that were making choices every day that could have sunk our economy or helped us recover. Why? Because he has high authority. So high authority testimonials, verifiable testimonials, testimonials with emotion, with pathos, testimonials illustrated with imagery can still be compelling. But do not think you've got number 13 simply because you slapped some testimonials on your site. Awards are a powerful and compelling way to provide evidential, to provide evidence for your argument. Sometimes the list of clients, sometimes reviews, certifications, quantitative facts. This is the place in your site where you bolster your, your evolutionary argument and your ultimate reason with true and powerful reasons. Are you following the logic here? So now think about your page. This is flowing naturally. If you have this overstuck somewhere where people aren't seeing it, it's not helping you a bit. If you expect people to click through to see it, it's probably not helping you in most cases. And, 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 and it's not that you're gonna take this argument that you've written and slap it on the site. You're gonna translate this argument into an ultimate reason and support it with these evidentials. And this is how you create a landing page that penetrates the mind. I've said this before, I only say it for people that are new. Many of you have heard it many, many times, but I have to keep saying it because it's so easy to forget. You're not building a page. There is no page. You're creating an impact, a phenomena in the mind. You're doing it with zeros and ones and pixels. And you're taking those zeros and ones and pixels and restructuring a set of observations that people are going to encounter with their senses. And seeing those observations, they're going to imply conclusions. And from those conclusions, they're going to make a decision. And from that decision, they're going to have a set of expectations. And following that, they're going to get the experience you're offering. That yes, don't ever forget this. The moment they say yes, you have put yourself into a unique position 
to exceed their expectations or disappoint them. And you are now in the midst of a trust trial. And if you fail, it's dangerous. If you pass, that relationship deepens with layer and layer of trust. And it's the same way when you meet a new person and start establishing a friendship. Because a customer is a person. And the customer and the company have a real relationship. Not something like a relationship, a real relationship. And you better build it with care. All right, now, Dave says, I just put one of those on my site. Congratulations, Dave. And Cynthia, I've worked a lot with regulated industries. You can see her comment. And you may not be able to use the Kame company logo. You may be limited, but so are all your competitors. So you can still use that to your advantage if you learn how to create the types of, uh, of evidentials that you can use. I've done this with insurance for Aetna. And every single page, every page had to be approved in 50 states. I've done it in Canada with the Royal Bank of Canada. I've done it in the U.S. with other major banks. There is a way in regulated industries to impact and to, and to have these evidentials integrated, but you've got to do it in a careful way. And it's one of the things we teach in our quick win uh, intensives. All right, so you're following me so far. Is this making sense? Does anybody have a question about what we said thus far? Think for just a moment. While you're thinking about that, we're going to pull up a live op page here in just a moment. Cliff, let's go full screen on the, on the diagram. And I'd like to scroll down and look at the last three points together. Support, call to action, and urgency. Let's just take a moment for support and let's go back to something I said earlier but not lose too much time on it. The central argument should be in the central column. And the central column should be dominant. Three evenly weighted columns works only when people are beginning a, a funnel and trying to sort themselves out. Typically, and there's exceptions to everything I say. Typically, when you have those columns, you want one dominant column and either a supporting column on the left or a supporting column on the right, but you don't want three evenly weighted columns because that's like three people talking to you at the same time. So use the column for support. Sean says gold. Thank you, Sean. I, it's really important. I, I watch your feedback. And uh, because I believe a speaker should opt, let the audience optimize their presentation and so... I'd, I'd be lost without live chat. If you're on here and you're lurking in the background, feel free to participate, engage, get involved with us, because you'll help us do a better job of helping everyone else. Uh, in the meantime, I want to take you to the call to action. Now, you'll notice something. We call this the how. So this also shows you a problem with a thought sequence. I'm going to erase everything I have here, and uh, let's go to the whiteboard, Cliff. All right, now as you view the whiteboard, I'm going to reach down here and pick up this eraser, and I want to talk to you about the how. The how is a critical piece. It's the one we focus on the most, but we still don't get it right. The how comes after the what and the why, so let's think about that for a second. So the what is essentially the solution you're offering, regardless of what form it is. The, the why is why you should take advantage of this solution. And remember, in a why, it always has two components. They make a judgment about the offering and they make a judgment about you. We tend to forget that. But if they don't trust you, they don't trust your offer. And so everything you do that's inconsistent with what you claim jeopardizes them saying yes. So be careful that the personality and the, and the, the, the identity that you communicate about who you are is empowering and thus they will have more trust in what it is that you offer. So two things. And I'm going to say the person to make that really clear. And then comes the offer. Okay? Now, with that being said, if I decide in that process I've described in the trust trial, if I conclude positive things about you and thus decide to go forward with you, you need to tell me how to do so. And how is the CTA? So now we can sort of see a symbiosis between these three components and how they fit into the sequence of thought as we lay out the design of the page. But it's very important that we talk about the how. Now, the first thing we need to be careful of is that we don't copy everybody else's how. That's the most common mistake on the internet. In the internet, Best practices are just pooled ignorance. So often we choose to shift down into a very sales type 
tone that jeopardizes consistency with the way we have used declaration. I'm getting ready to teach. I don't know when yet. I'm still thinking about it. I'm running experiments with it on what I call the anti-offer page. I'm against offer page thinking, even though you hear me teaching about offer pages every day. The ultimate offer page doesn't feel like an offer page. Anybody on here study the martial arts? If you have, you may be familiar with something called Tai Chi. Uh, the, if you study Tai Chi, the idea is uh, with the least amount of energy you produce the greatest impact. And this is when you use it defensively. By the same token, we have a concept here called M4L. How to get the most for the least. Let's take that concept to uh, another world. Let's take it to finance. A VC is trying to get the highest return for the least amount of risk. And so is any financial engineer running a major fund. So there is this piece of physics slash philosophy in a production-oriented world, and our entire world, I'm going back to philosophy now, is all about inputs, process, and outputs. That's what an organism is. That's what keeps it alive. It inputs, it processes, it outputs. That's true of a single-cell amoeba, and that's true of the biggest company in the world. If you want to change th uh, things around you, you have to pay attention to have the right input, to process it properly, and then output it in the best form. Now, if that seems a bit uh, abstract, let me ground it. When you are communicating with an offer page, you want the fight to be a no fight. This is why you don't make claims, you foster conclusions. Let's give you another example. Most of us have somebody we care about. Let's suppose we all, I know we all don't, but for a moment I'm going to use my daughter. She's 21 years of age. She's at Harvard. She worked here. And now she's doing some other interesting work. I think if my 21-year-old daughter is about to engage in a self-defense situation, the best thing she can possibly do is escape without having to defend herself. Would you all agree? If there's a way to get in the car, get away, uh, confuse them, uh, get inside some safer place, the best fight, hear me, is no fight. Now that's true in self-defense. It's also true in your landing page. The anti-landing page that I want to teach you about does not feel like a landing page. It it's all about clarity and explanation. It's allowing the right people to find you and get the right message and thus make the right decision. It doesn't engage in hype. It doesn't use persuasion tactics. And for all of my talk of psychology, I don't want to talk you into anything. The great marketers don't talk you into things. They help you see. And when you see for yourself, you make a wise choice. The Greeks have a word for that. And it's interesting. It's interesting enough to put on this page and tie it right to the call to action. It's called, in Greek, synesis. And I think the way you would probably write that is like this. Um, there's two ways they form their S. I'll use this way and then I'll, I'll go back to the iota and, uh, and here. And there's a different S that we'll use on the front of that. But my point for you is synesis is a form of wisdom. And do you know what it means? Fascinating word. Right seeing. What you're trying to do is help the right person make a wise choice. And to do that, they have to see right. And they can't see right when you don't communicate your value in a clear way. They can't see right when you get in your own way. And our problem is not our competition. Our problem is us. We get in our own way. And one of the things that we do is we talk with a tone that makes people not trust what we say. So make sure your call to action is clear. And tells them exactly what will happen when they respond. Did you hear that? Let's make some rules. Are you ready? We're almost done with this. And uh, Paul, have a live op page up. I'm looking at my time. Somebody give me a time uh, so I can be certain I'm, I'm landing this plane when I need to. Yeah, 44 minutes. All right, it needs to be clear. And so many times they're fuzzy. It needs to be value positive. What does that mean? It means, don't say click here, say get instant access now. Um, it needs to be timed to the sequence of thought. 
Don't tell me to buy when I still need to learn more. Tell me I can learn more. Let's go back to New York Times example, Paul, real quick. I named the brand. <laughs> All right, erase that from your mind. I got one of those pins like they use in uh, Men in Black, and I'm going to get you with it. All right. Notice the two. Notice the two versions. Remember, A is the optimized version. The the first version looks really good. Subscribe and save. But there's three calls to action. You got to wonder: Is it for the same thing? Are those three different things? Are those three different natures of the offer? But most importantly, they tell you to subscribe and save. I'm not ready to subscribe yet. I don't know enough yet. What's the other button say? View subscription options. Way higher click through. And you may recall 137% increase in purchases. So your call to action needs to be clear. It needs to be value positive. It needs to be timed to the right place in the sequence of thought. And then there's one more thing it needs. It needs a backstop. What's a backstop? Right there on the geography of the page, which we which we use to control the chronology in the mind. When we make this ask and we get it right, we also back it up with a strong authority-driven testimonial, a promise to protect your privacy, uh, a, a note about our refunds, or our guarantee, but any hesitation right at that spot, we hit it with a backstop to make it easier to respond. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a word up for you, all right? Backstopped. These four components come together to help you get a call to action that produces the greatest response rate. Is that making sense to everyone? All right. Sean said he already knew who it was. That's right, Sean. It was the Dallas Morning News. All right. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's, uh, let's go. Uh, and Julia, I see you have a bed and breakfast website you created. Feel free to shoot that over to us. If we don't get to it today, we might get to it on another day. Anybody on this call... Send us your pages. We want to help you. And uh, you can learn about something. We can help you also with a, uh, getting you in one of our quick win intensives where we can really work on the pages for two days together. But for now, I'll just help you any way I can. What I want to do right now is go to a live op page. I haven't seen this page. This is my first time looking at it with you. And let's just think about what we've been learning. Humana Medicare plans. Somebody tell me what's the problem with Humana Medicare plans. There's a huge problem with that opening. What is that problem? I know it takes you a moment to catch up because of the delay. Someone says, it's a title, not a headline. Precisely said, David. Uh, David is a great marketer, built a great business, and uh, I'm pretty amazed with what he's done. And, uh, and take a look over here. Humana Medicare Plans is a title. And since it's not a sentence that makes meaning, it does nothing to create connection. It just tells me where I'm at. I need more than that. If I meet a complete stranger and all I learn is their name, this is not by itself going to attract me into a genuine relationship. I need connection and a headline is supposed to do two things. Somebody tell me what it is. You optimize this page. What is it supposed to do? Headline has two goals. What's the first one? I'm giving you a second, it's the, it's the delay. Capture attention. Exactly the right answer. The first micro yes in a headline is yes, I'll give you my attention. Capture attention. But if you get my attention, I mean, uh, let's, I've got Paul over here. Paul, come over and see me. I'm going to pick on Paul. Paul is a content guy uh, and he's our director of marketing, uh, sitting next to our an other director of marketing and editorial content. And I guess that we have to arm, have an arm wrestling match to decide who's the most powerful. But when Dan sat down by Paul, he said to me, I'm Paul's understudy today in a sarcastic way. And we all laughed. Take a look at this guy. I'm picking on him because if I were to see him walk into uh, a place of business, he would capture my attention just by virtue of that amazing eBay shirt that he's wearing, which we all know about. We've talked about this shirt, all right? And he said to me, hey, Flint, these things sell on eBay. He, has a, he, does, he tests on eBay all the time and has, his, has an eBay business on the side. We tell our employees to, to do that. It's good for them. It helps us better. But would you agree? Look at there. Joshua Singer loves the shirt. I appreciate it. All right. So some people might see that shirt and it would capture their attention. And some people, Joshua Singer, it might even convert to interest. By the way, it has dinosaurs on it. <laughs> you missed it. That's right. It, his, his kids love the shirt. Um, it has dinosaurs and uh, it's a creative shirt. All right. Now, here's my point. It reminds me, and I know I'm picking on Paul, but he runs all, you know, he does all of our, you know, it's good for you to know him. And he'll be on some of these teaching himself. What, Paul, what Paul's shirt does is capture attention, but it's going to take more than that to convert 
interest. You'd literally have to speak to him, have a conversation. You wouldn't become Paul's best friend simply because he wore that shirt. Sorry to disappoint you, Paul. All right, thanks, buddy. I know agencies everywhere that can capture your attention. I mean, you can put on a top hat and walk down the street and people look at you. I mean, you can, I, I know one, comp, I know one big gigantic bank that had this little cartoon figure that danced around the top of the page. It got a lot of people's attention, but did it actually sell anything? Did it convert it to interest? Did it establish rapport? Did it build a relationship? No. No. A cartoon is not a connector in most cases. The way it was executed there, it was not. So what do you have to do here? Well, you've got to use a headline to capture attention, convert it to interest, and, and that's the first thing missing here, Humana Medicare plans. And then it's, see plans in your area with their premiums, copays, and participating doctors and pharmacies. Let me ask you a clear question. Why the hell would you even waste time building this page? Are you going to teach me about dogs? I don't, I'm not trying to be harsh on the marketer. I'm pretending to be a jaded consumer. It's not hard to pretend because I am a jaded consumer and so are you. We're sick of things that waste our time and make claims. So look at this. This page isn't doing any work. Why should I click through? If Might as well put the plans right there. If you're not going to put the plans right there, then, then why do you have this page? What is its function? All it's doing is requiring me to click. And when you ask me to click, typically on average, you lose right away 50% of your prospective audience. So I have a title. I have no connection whatsoever. Why do I care about your plans? Why do I care about you? Why should I trust you? What is your value proposition? Nothing in this 21 elements is clear here. And then shop plans. I have no reason yet to shop plans with you. You're asking me to do something I'm not ready to do. I want to know why Humana. Why Humana Medicare plans? And so not only have you not given me any information, you've not engaged me in conversation, you've not established rapport, you've not followed almost any of the 21 rules, you wasted more than half the space with a picture of a dog and a ball. Now, that's a nice couple and that's a nice dog and I love dogs. We have three in my house. But for what purpose does that image exist? To take up space on the page. It does nothing. And so, Paul, Paul are you showing that to the audience? No, I'm gonna chat. All right, Paul is chatting a place to buy the shirt, okay? Here you are. If you don't know this, YouTube Live is all about selling shirts. That's what we do here at Mech Labs. We sell shirts. The rest is just a smoke screen so that we can put one in front of you. Uh, yes, buy that shirt, Joshua. And, uh, and when you visit us in the studio, you can wear it. All right, he, he actually found one somewhere on eBay that said optimization or conversion expert or something. At a thrift store. Yeah. At a thrift store. And he, he wears that to work sometimes. We all, we, we have, there's a lot of humor here. Take a look at the page again. And do you see... The call to action doesn't, it's not clear. I don't even know what that means. Shop plans, how many plans? What's gonna happen when I click on this button? I have no idea. There's no value there. Shop is not a value. I wanna solve a problem. I'm not trying to shop plans. People may like to shop, you may like to shop, but how many of you like to shop for Medicare plans? How does that sound for a fun, interesting daily activity? And then it's not timed at the right time in the thought sequence and there's nothing underneath it. No backstop, nothing. So I'm gonna ask one single question. Why does anybody ever click on that button and buy a plan? Can someone give me a reason? There is a reason. I want you to understand that because you understand the psychology. Tell me what it is. Hmm, you're thinking. It's hard, but there's a reason. Somebody's clicked on that button and probably bought a plan. They probably didn't buy it online. I assume they went to a call center, but see again, I don't know what's gonna happen. I don't know what you do. Do I click see a plan and call somebody? Probably. Dave Fogel missed the question. Paul's shirt distracted him. <laughs> Dave, I don't blame you. I'm distracted too. The reason that guy's buying a plan is because he threw out his back playing with his dog. That's Will Carter talking. All right, Will, good call. All right, somebody else says they wanna play ball with a dog. <laughs> Here, here's why, you sarcastic bunch, you. Because Humana's brand is well known. The brand has momentum. Somebody is using brand momentum to cover up horrific marketing. A terrible job. And so, brand covers a multitude of sins. There are also people highly motivated. I mean, they have a short period of time to enroll. We've worked with Medicare, with Aetna, and a group called Healthspire, fantastic company. 
The CEO's name is Dennis, and uh, I think it's Macriva. I don't know how to pronounce the last name, but he's an analytics guy who became the CEO, and he's brilliant, and we're friends now. So I've learned a little bit about this business. There are people who have to make a decision, and they know who humanity is, and so they'll go through this pain. But how many of you, here's the test of your page, and here's the test of your brand. If you're on here and you represent a big brand, ask yourself a question. If I took my brand off the page, if my brand was brand new, how many people would buy without the brand? You smaller companies have that problem already. Companies with a big brand have multiplied ineptitude and covered it with the actual effectiveness of the people before. I don't mean to be harsh, because that's not, even the person that submitted this page, I, I, I'm not faulting that person, I'm trying to help you understand the, the primary problem, okay? All right, I'm out of time. We've just gone through the 21 psychological elements. On every one of these points, we have other teaching. You can dig around at mechlabs.com, marketexperiments.com. Also, uh, I talk about this stuff on LinkedIn. You should look for me on LinkedIn and Instagram, where uh, I have a picture up there from yesterday where I was fishing with my daughter last night off our dock. But there's also all sorts of things about marketing on there. It's more personal. and. Uh, and most of all, we want you to like this and to share it with people and help us grow the community. And uh, all that being said, next week, here's what we're doing. Last thing I wanna say, and I'm excited about it. We taught on the customer theory, how to build a predictive model of your customer's mind and the power of that. And so many people have asked for copies of that, but we did not post it live on YouTube or we didn't post it on YouTube. I taught it live because we had a technical error. I'm gonna reteach it, but next, Week, I'm gonna teach it differently with a giant graphic that outlines every, C, every key piece and a single coherent picture like we've done with this. If you like that, and if you like these graphics, tell us that. I'm using that more than slides, I'm weary of slides, and it's not enough to show people 40 individual pictures. As a teacher, I long to show you one picture that ties everything we've said together, and that's why we're taking this approach. Tell us if you like it, and join us next week at one o'clock. Thanks.